Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ben King. That's enough, that's enough. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, the polite thing is to say hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, what's up? Um, let's just quickly thank Josh for sharing his story. Come on, let's give him a big round of applause. Man, I, I, I kind of feel like you, you sort of add all my problems already. <laughs> so I don't have to speak. Let's just like play some music, okay? No, I'm just kidding. Um, my name's Ben. Uh, Thanks so much for coming down today, fighting the haze and all. Hey, but no school, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here um, to talk to you guys about leadership. Um, and I'm a bit of a rambler, so any point in time if I start rambling, someone come up and smack me, please. That would be good. Um, but in case you tune out completely to what I say, uh, there's three things I want you to remember from today, okay? Just three things. First thing, is that whatever pain you're feeling right now in your life, you can turn that into power. What? Deep, yeah, Shima? That's right, man. That's what's up, man. Okay, number two. You don't have to be an influencer to be an influence. That's such a gross word, influencer. But anyway, and the third thing is sometimes you've got to take a leap and build your wings on the way down. I love that quote. That's like one of my favorite quotes in life. Um, and they always say that a good speech, you got to give like three points, right? Three things. And the appropriate thing to do today would be to give you three things that like I've done in my life to sort of help you become successful or become a leader in your own respective lives. But that's too commercial. That's boring. So today, um, I'm going to give you three things um, that really brought me down, uh, aka three of my demons in my life that I had to fight through um, just to get where I'm at today. Because we all have demons in our lives. You know, we all go through like a period of time where um, we face things. And because of the fact that we have such amazing Asian heritage, we're like super scared to talk about it with our friends, right? Or even to appear weak. And I think like Singaporean culture, our society here, promotes the idea of success that equates to like financial stability or success equals um, a, a whole bunch of different things, right? That you have to attain a, a certain level of standard of living or in your career or in your social circle that it just really messes up your life, man. Like, it become, you become just another cookie cutter. You become like a cardboard cutout of everyone else. And that's not how to live your life at all. All right, that's not, that's not a standard you should adhere yourself to at all. And I'll tell you first up, I'm a really messed up kid. <laughs> Like, I'm super messed up. I'm super neurotic, and I grew up, like, basically, I grew up as Josh. Like, we have, like, the same history. Who are you, man? Just stealing my identity. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to share with you three things really quick um, that sort of almost nearly destroyed me. The first of all uh, being money, right? Because that's all we pretty much talk about in Singapore, your GDP, right? How much... What's, how, much you, how much you should earn in a month? What's your basic salary income? What's enough to, to secure you a housing loan? And I'm messed up because like right now, I'm a musician, I'm an actor, I'm freelance, so like I don't get CPF, right? Unless I declare. Um, so it's really on my onus to save. And I think growing up, that was a big thing for me. It was, I've, I've always wanted to be like an actor, an artist, a musician. So straight off, I knew, okay, like I'm not gonna be earning big bucks. I, I, just what I told myself, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be an uphill challenge from here on end. But I really wanted to do it. So that was my goal. And I remember, um, I was born into a pretty decent family. We were quite comfortable. And then when I was eight, uh, my mom contracted cancer. And she contracted it at a stage where it was semi-serious. It was like 2.5, if you know the numbers. And, um, and hospital bills are not cheap. Medical bills are not cheap. So. From the point she contracted cancer um, to a couple of years later, we lost a whole bunch of money. Um, it was quite tough because we sort of went through the uh, Western medicine approach. We didn't go through the whole TCM thing because we were quite jakang tangla. So we were like, okay, Ken, let's go Western medicine. Um, and that took a toll on our, on our family's finance. So my dad is a really smart dude. Uh, he works very hard. And he just basically brought us back to normal by... 
um, by working extra hard and watching the property. So from that point, uh, when she contracted cancer till, till now, I've moved like 10 times in my life already. Yo, I'm like an expert packer, okay? I can pack my room in, in 30 minutes. Can you do that? I don't think so. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, so I had to move constantly. And so home was um, just a non-existent thing for me because I had to move so much. And I basically lived out of boxes. Um, but I did learn that money was an incredibly important thing uh, to every Singaporean. And I think a couple of years ago, I was like, okay, I really want to be um, an artist. I want to do music. I want to do acting full time. So I was like, okay, I'm going to tell my dad. I don't care what he's going to say. Like, I'm going to like face him. I'm going to eventually like, like sit him down and go, yo, dad, what's up? What's up? What's good, dad? I, I, uh, I got to talk to you and try to be all like, like gangster and stuff. Yo, what's good, dad? Yeah. He's like, what you want? I was like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a musician. Yeah, that's what's up. What you gonna do about it? So I, I expected my dad to go like, what is this rubbish? Uh, you think what this kind of career? Uh, you cannot be like doctor or liar or financial consultant. I waste my money. What's in her And like all that kind of stuff. Okay, that's not really how my dad talks. It's just like a representation. So I expected like a big lecture from him, and then um, all I got was, okay. <laughs> really? That, that, that's all you're gonna say to me? You're just gonna, just gonna say okay? Mm, yeah, okay. Uh, you're not gonna lecture me or tell me how to live my life? No. Carry on. Oh, sweet. Okay, thanks, Dad. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Obviously, that's not his voice, but he basically, um, at that point, said this to me. He was like, okay, you want to be a musician? You want to be an actor? You want to be an artist? Fine. Go do it. Go chase your dreams, whatever. Everyone is successful in whatever respective craft. If they work really hard and try to be the best, then there's definitely some sort of financial gain from there. But he said to me, first off, you're not going to get any more allowance anymore. Like, you're going to get cut from me. I'm like, yeah, pff, sure, no problem. Also, you're going to start paying rent, $700 a month. You're also going to start paying for the car, which you always borrow, $300 a month. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'll earn that, I'll earn that back for you, no worries. I, I, I've got jobs outside. It's like, okay, I'm sure. When I checked my bank account, I had 80 bucks. I was like, oh my God. Like, how am I going to do this? Um, but he was dead serious about it. He was dead serious about giving me that tough love thing. Uh, so I did. And... Um, and I just stuck it out, and it was really tough for a couple of months, but he helped me through it and helped me see that it's just more than, than the glitz and glamour of it all. It's more than just singing a song or, or, or doing a play. It's really about thinking about it as a legit career and thinking about how to provide um, for your future family and stuff. And I remember one Chinese New Year, I remember this so clearly. I was having um, lunch with all my other relatives at the time, and they're all joking about, right? And then my uncle turns to me in this joking stupor, and he was like, Huh, so when are you going to get a real job? In front of everyone. And I was like, I, w I wanted to say, this is a real job. Like, it's completely a real job. I am self-sustaining. I'm financially stable. It's a viable job. But I was so hurt that I didn't know how to say it. And I wish I did. I wish I stood up for my convictions and what I believed in. So I guess the question um, that you have to answer for yourself and that you have to define is, are you rich? Are you rich. Let's put some things in perspective. You and I ain't born based on a directive, but the fact is our lives are locked by this singular word. Don't blame society, mentality of the herds. There are four definitions of rich. The first one's funny, wealthy, having a great deal of assets or money. But it's not remotely funny that some kid in your class, and you don't know this, but he thinks of himself as the last person you want to hang with because you got your fancy toys and towers, while his dad works two jobs till ungodly hours. And he's been fighting this fight ever since he was eight, trying to split five dollars over date by date by date, while his mom fights through chemo. She's his only hero. But 10 grand a month and the medical bills, not every hero makes it over every hill. So he grows up, wishing his shoes were a little nicer, his clothes, his watch, daddy's car was a little nicer, or that he even had a car. So when he picks him up from school while other kids jump into rides, really cool, he's got to walk with his old man and his big umbrella. Walk brisk. 
can't even bear to look behind, and I wish to death I could bend space and time and say, listen, poor is a state of mind. The currency of your heart is stronger any time. Some people will judge you based on social status and money. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. We're born into wealth. Our lives are collective of a wellspring of good thoughts and bad thoughts where happiness is subjective. So you decide to check your bank book, feel that sickly weight on your shoulders, and you can't look. <laughs> but still, you look around when everybody in town is labeling you high class, middle class, Lower class. Judgment abounds. So that's what this is. Humanity. With it down to facts and stats. It's insanity. Listen, my name is not a number. My blood type, not letters. My ethnicity, not a faction. My culture, not creed. My language, not a syllabus. My religion, not a business. My occupation, not just the way to lay this table with food. Don't you ever dare tell me! I'll amount to no good. And if they dare to take a swing, you got to dare to take a hit. They wear an iron fist, but the gloves don't fit. So it don't hurt. Believe me, they can't even hack it. Like a 20 cent man in a thousand dollar jacket. Like a 20 cent man in a thousand dollar jacket. I guess that wakes, that's what makes them first world. Diamond necklace pearls where the man across the street and his little girl are busy selling tissue. Their little tissue empire. Kind of like your MNC, but just a little higher. He lifts her on his shoulders so she can see a little higher. And what does she see? She sees her wealth. She's rich. And not the first definition, redefining her terms, cashing in, believing. Rich, having a high value or quality. Rich, magnificently impressive in quality. Rich, deep and vivid in color, sense, or smell. Barista or billionaire, nobody can tell. And why should they? What exactly are you investing? Stocks, bonds, life, love? Why not throw the rest in? Life's a big melting pot. You can't just use one flavor. Do yourself a favor and save your money, but more importantly, your soul. Because one can hold you out, the other make you whole. Your life is a checkbook. Pages are your days. Write carefully and sign off the trills you want to blaze. Don't count five million with a flick of a hand. Count five million once for every man. And maybe in some facets, we won't be number one, but we'll be happy when the harvest is done. Sign the bottom line, doesn't matter which, make peace with your heart, and you will always be rich. Thank you. So all that mumbo jumbo uh, was, um, was a spoken word piece that I wrote um, in response to my uncle. I hope he watched it. <laughs> and I put it up on YouTube. Um, and it's one of those things where Something really hits you very hard, and you, and you realize that it's a vulnerable spot, but you realize that being vulnerable and being open is a very powerful thing, and it's a very powerful tool. Another thing that, um, that I had to deal with, obviously, was um, my mom's journey with cancer. I was very close to my mom, the kind of close that I think only a mother and son could have, where uh, she really doted on me, and she was just, just a really cool person. And... Uh, she contracted cancer when I was eight, um, and it went to remission for a while. It came back, she fought it for four years, and she passed away when I was 12, uh, like two days before my PSLE. So I just like left the paper on its own, I couldn't even think. Um, and it was just sort of a thing that I had to deal with since young. I mean, understanding how cancer worked and how it operated. And I think dealing with that sort of thing from a young age, I mean, for some of you, it might not be the passing of a loved one, it might be um, let's say, like your parents are not getting along, or um, you know, someone in school is really just being outwardly mean to you, or whatever it is. We deal with it in different ways. Um, and it was hard because I didn't have anybody to talk to who could understand what I was going through. Uh, so the way I coped was through music. I started writing songs. I wrote a lot of songs uh, about that experience, and songs that just should never have left the bedroom. You know, songs that you write just for therapy. And so they helped me get through um, uh, that really tough time. And then few, like a couple of years later, the band started, um, the San Willow started, and we were putting together our first EP, and we were looking for songs to put on the album. And then 
um, they were like, hey, Narelle was like, you have this song, right? Um, it's called Night Light. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's about mom. And she's like, yeah, I think it's a great song. We should put it on the album. I was like, okay, sure. And at the same time, I was like, no, my song! Because you want to be precious with these sort of things, right? Like, they, they're really personal. And yet, um, I was so scared to, to, to show it because it was such a vulnerable song. It was at a point in my life where I was, like, super broken. But she was like, no, it's a good song. Put it on. So they did. They put it in the album, and we went into recording. And at the time, I was busy with a theater show. So I couldn't be there um, in the studio. So I would call them, and I'd go, hey, how's the recording going? And they'd be like, oh, it's so good. Like, we just tracked guitars today. We tracked strings. Uh, we're going to track drums tomorrow. It's sounding super great. People are going to love it. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So after my theater run, I went back to the studio to check it out. And then they pressed play. It was like the worst three minutes of my life. It turned to this cheesy, like, Chinese pop song. <laughs> okay, nothing, not, not that Chinese pop is bad at all. I love Chinese pop. Uh, but it was just super, it was like, it was like super meaty and it was compressed and it just sounded like a generic pop song. And I was like, I can't even listen to this. I didn't want to play it live at all. And I hated it so much. It just felt like the worst thing. And then after the album got out a little bit, uh, and it was just, uh, it, we were just starting out at the point. So not many people knew us. I started getting stories from people. Um, and they were like, yeah, we heard Nightlight. And uh, it really helped me deal with like, like, my father's, my, like my father's journey with cancer or this and that. Um, and it, you don't know how much it touched me. And I was like, huh? Like, for real? They're like, yeah, it really, it really impacted me. Um, and I just realized the power of being vulnerable, the power of being open and not being scared to, to be who you are, you know? And more, I, I mean, as I, I've, I've been through, like what Josh has said, a lot of anxiety and stuff as well. I used to be bullied quite crazily. I'll ask you guys right now for a show of hands of who goes through anxiety disorder or suicidal thoughts or who are being bullied in school. But I know, like, it's the hardest thing to raise that hand. It's the hardest thing to admit to someone that you're going through these things because you want to put up an impression that you're okay or put up a facade that everything is fine, that, like, and that's, that that it's easier than it seems, but it's not easy. What you guys are going through right now in terms of school, in terms of the pressures on you, societal pressure, pressure from your family, pressures from school, it's so not easy. And I'm the stranger to you guys, but I am so proud of each and every one of you for sticking it out, for going through what must be one of the toughest systems in the world and hopefully becoming people that are not confined to societal standards. The things that make you weird now are the things that are really going to define you in a couple of years. I just want you guys to know that. Um, and it's not easy to deal with, with, with these thoughts. But at the same time, when you reach a point when you are okay with talking about it, talk about it to someone. It's very important to talk about these things. And eventually, if you, if you find yourself in a position to help someone else go through these things, it's tough. It's really, really tough but you can change your life. And you don't have to have 50,000 followers on Instagram. You don't have to be um, a notable personality. You just have to be you. And you have to be real, because there's too much inauthenticity going around in this, in this business today. There's too much fake people in our lives. So just be real. Just be real to people. I put out another spoken word piece. I don't know if we have time for it, because I think I'm like rambling. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, but in any case, I, won't, I probably won't perform it, uh, but it's a piece that talks about anxiety disorder, suicidal thoughts, um, and how I had to go through it. And again, I was super apprehensive to put it out, but I was like, okay, let's just do it. Let's put it out. Um, and I put it out on YouTube. Uh, and again, the moment I put it out, I was hit with an, an insane anxiety attack. Like I couldn't breathe, and I was like, Whoa, what am I doing? I just basically like add my dirty laundry in public on YouTube, right? Like that's the worst thing. And, and I was so prepared to take it on the next day. But when the morning came, I got this uh, message from my Facebook inbox. And it was this, this guy. Um, and he was like, I don't know you. You don't know me. I mean, I roughly know who you are. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I was going to kill myself today. And then I watched your video. And you basically just talked me off the ledge. And I was like, like oh my gosh. <laughs> like,
like if I have the power to save someone with all my unworthiness and what lousy feelings I have, I'm just like just just one person. I'm not even significant. But if I can talk someone off the ledge, then like this is the greatest blessing ever, you know. And nothing I can do in my career would ever amount to to this or to what this is for me. So, yeah, I realize that it's so incredible to be vulnerable and that we all go through a battle. And that's the thing about being a leader. Nobody cares about leaders who are full of themselves or who are just reading off a script. The best leaders follow. The best leaders listen to you, listen to other people. The best leaders are real. The best leaders serve. And serving is a thing that, can, that you can do anytime. You can easily serve yourself. But how amazing it is to serve someone else, how amazing it is to impact someone else's life, to be there for somebody else. That's the kind of leaders that I want to follow. That's the kind of leader that I want to be. That's the kind of leader that I hope each and every one of you will be one day. So I'm going to quickly play, because um, the guitar is here, um, I'm going to quickly play uh, the song that I wrote. I wrote it, like, I think in 2010, so it was, like, super scratchy. Um, and it's not at all polished at all. Um, it, it's pretty much how it was written, and I'll just play how it was written. So it's very raw. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing J Justin Bieberish, I promise you. Um, but it means a lot to me. It will mean a lot to me if you guys hear it. So are you cool if I play a little tune for you? Cool. So the story behind the song is um, when I was very young, um, I used to stay in the same room as my sister Narelle on a double deck a bit, and my mom would, without a doubt, every night come over um, and sort of flip on that nightlight with this little nightlight in the corner of our room and a plug, and she'd just flip it on for us at night. It's just a little gesture, but I think as years went by, it became a symbol of how she was always there for us, how she was very selfless, and how she would always um, endeavor to turn on that light in our lives, and how we would, in turn, want to turn on the light in other people's lives. Preachy! But, um, yeah, so, this is Nightlight. Thank you. 
frozen locks And her hair falls in locks Thank you.